Hello world, hello internet, hello people with um, a strange, possibly unhealthy fixation for PM and Cabinet, which I have to say probably includes me because I've lost track of the number of times I've tried to record this presentation. Um, it's a slightly different version of another presentation that I've got out there, but I don't mind uh, doing this again because this is a very, very complicated issue, but it's right at the heart of the British political system, and so it can't possibly hurt. Uh, it's coming at it from a number of different angles. Anyway, do try to stay with me. Let's see where we go. So, we've talked previously about the relationship between ministers and their civil servants. Remember, ministers are utterly disposable. They are here today, gone tomorrow. I can't even spell dispose. Disposable. Uh, close enough. Um, they are here today, gone tomorrow, like yesterday, snow. Um, they are not experts in their field. They are experts in making decisions. They are supposed to have good judgment. The people who know how the country runs and how the country works are the civil servants. These are the guys who've been doing it for a career ever since they left university. And yes, we're not talking about the people who drive buses or the people who uh, put on uniforms and keep our streets safe. We're talking about the pen pushers, the bureaucrats who are there making sure all the paperwork's in place, who are coming up with policies and explaining policies and policy options to ministers and then taking the decisions that the minister has and turning them into real life applications. So this is the relationship between the permanent executive and the political executive. These guys are permanent, they're anonymous and they're neutral. These guys are anything but permanent. They're certainly not anonymous and by very definition they're not neutral. And if you can follow that given these squiggles on the line on the page, which really are profoundly unhelpful, you've done extremely well. Um, if you haven't, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to clear up these confusions or any uh, misunderstanding that may follow. Let's move on. Um, so we've got uh, all of this, uh, we, we've got all of these various uh, ministers, political executive. Uh, let's drill into that in a little more detail because this is really where we want to go. And uh, so government exists. The government will always exist. Number 10 is there, but we don't know who's in it. It changes depending upon who Parliament wants to run the government. And it's currently this fella, but he can't do it all by himself. So once he's invited by, uh, by Parliament, by the Crown essentially, to form a government, he then rounds up 97 or so of his nearest and dearest friends and asks them to form a government. And then out of that 90-odd, uh, he will then identify a further 26 or 30-odd who he wants to come and join him on the management committee of, uh, of uh, Albion PLC. So if this is Albion PLC, uh, this is the management committee. There's our CEO, uh, chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, that is... Um, What's his name? Osborne. He's in there somewhere. But this is the management committee. This is essentially the management committee responsible for running uh, Albion PLC, that is the, the United Kingdom. There we go. So, um, management committee, they're sitting around the table, they're making all of the decisions that are then given to the civil service, and the civil service takes those decisions, the policy, and turns it into real life applications. Now, this is a slide that has been causing me no end of grief. But anyway, here we go. So this is essentially government. We've got um, a division here between the political and the permanent. This is the permanent. And of course, this means that this must be the political. And we can see here the big institutions of state. Uh, we've got defense. We've got um, work and pensions. We've got these various other things, the foreign office, the home office. And from time to time, they will be given new managers. And those new managers will come from the political world and so these are political appointments the cabinet the prime minister one of his jobs is to hand out these big jobs and so he will variously put his friends slash associates slash enemies in place and their job is to make the decisions to, to exercise judgment uh, as to what the uh, foreign office should be doing the home office should be doing uh, all of these other defense, uh, justice, all of these guys, these are the big offices of state. They continue to run. Every time we get a new government, then we get rid of those guys, but the actual institutions remain. The institutions remain. The, the political office holders will change from time to time, but the institutions remain. Uh, it's just the people at the very top who are making the decisions. They are the political appointments by the prime minister. He gets to hand out the plum jobs and uh, all of the uh, rubbish jobs as well. Um, and he does that depending upon uh, who he wants to be uh, 
close to him, who he wants to be far away from him, and that's really where we're going. Now, when it comes to cabinet government, it's really very, very simple. There are only three principal rules. The first of those is that the Prime Minister sits in the middle of the web and he exercises his powers on the principle of primus inter pares. And uh, as we've discussed at great length, that means first among equals, and that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. You can't be first among equals. And so right at the heart of our uh, beautiful constitution, we have a contradiction. We have an inconsistency, a contradiction. What does it mean to be first among equals? It doesn't make sense. And so each prime minister gets to decide exactly how they want to play the primus into pares card. And uh, that gives shape and form and structure to their uh, administration. The other rules are to do with responsibility. We've got collective responsibility, which basically means they, they stand together and they hang together, and individual responsibility, which is the idea that each of those ministers is responsible for their own area of activity. So Nicky Morgan is responsible for everything that happens in education. Michael Fallon is responsible for everything that happens within defense. And that's both the decisions that are taken and the way in which those decisions are implemented, but we'll talk about that uh, in a second. So let's have a look at Primus and Paris in a little more detail. Um, we can look here at what that means in terms of cabinet, and really what it means is that they have control of the membership and they have control of the agenda. So they get to appoint members, uh, so we can go back to that diagram. We've got a handout to accompany this that will go through some of the jobs that Cameron has handed out. And uh, in addition to that, it, well, that basically means that he gets to keep his friends close and his enemies closer, which is a, an old friend's phrase or saying with which you should be very familiar. And he decides exactly who's going to do what. So he decides who he wants to be in cabinet and who's going to do what, who's going to be the secretaries of state, who's going to be the ministers, who's going to be the junior ministers. And that's very, very significant. That obviously puts the prime minister into position of significant uh, power. Uh, and don't uh, and there's certainly a hierarchy of posts in cabinet and in government, both in terms of ministerial rank, your junior ministers to your secretaries of state, uh, and indeed in terms of the difference in the different offices of state, of course, the, the plum jobs being uh, home office, foreign secretary, and of course, chancellor of the exchequer. In terms of the agenda, he decides what's discussed. The prime minister is control is in control of the parliamentary agenda. So not sorry government is in control of the parliamentary agenda. However, within that, it's all about wheels within wheels, and the uh, Prime Minister is in charge of the cabinet agenda. He decides what is discussed, and equally important, he decides where it is discussed. Now, that may seem a bit peculiar, uh, but when it comes to the issue of Iraq, and Iraq is very much uh, the defining uh, feature of cabinet government of recent times, uh, we can look into that in an awful lot of detail and we'll see exactly what was discussed, where it was discussed, and why that is so important. And it, uh, it, indeed, the, the very essence of Blair's administration can be resolved within, well, actually, between Iraq and, funnily enough, a rather trivial example, the Millennium Dome, which was in 1999. Actually, sorry, it was in 1997. Uh, but uh, the Millennium Dome itself came into existence in 1999-2000. We'll talk about those in class. Uh, two pivotal examples, one trivial, one very, very important, of how Blair ran his cabinet. Um, now, in terms of picking sides, keeping your friends close, what you want to do here is you want to reward your supporters. So you reward those people who've supported you all the way through. And uh, when we come to look at Cameron's cabinet, I want you to think about how... Uh, these positions might have been handed out. So you're rewarding support, you're encouraging ideological consistency, you don't want too many people uh, rocking the ideological boat, uh, and you also want to nurture talent. On the other hand, uh, you do want to have your enemies closer because you want to keep an eye on them, first of all, you want to know what they're up to. You want to tie them up with collective responsibility. So in other words, what you want here is a, uh, a sense in which diversity of opinion is expressed. But when it comes to uh, when it comes to the decision, everyone is bound by that collective responsibility, and so these guys can't be creating too much uh, of a stink. And the area where they really can uh, kick up a stink is on the back benches, where they're not bound uh, by collective responsibility. And instead of contributing to debate, well, if they're here, then they can say pretty much anything they like. And uh, one particular problem. Uh, here is a chap called David Davis, who has, uh, having left, since having left cabinet, has been a constant thorn 
uh, in um, in Cameron side, and we'll have perhaps a look at uh, his particular role um, in some detail. Anyway, so picking sides in terms of handing out positions, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer, is uh, one way of looking at it. I wouldn't necessarily express it like that in an exam, but it would certainly be one way in which I was thinking about it. Uh, in real life, the primus inter pares relationship is very much formed by personality and circumstances. Um, is the individual psychologically equipped uh, to run things from the center, or are they more inclined to be collegiate? Uh, and is this something they want to do? And we've got some critical examples here. We're going to have a quick look at uh, various prime ministers from Thatcher all the way through, uh, of course, to David Cameron and everything in between. And what we have there is a spectrum of psychological profiles uh, in terms of wanting to run everything and being prepared to delegate. And we'll talk more about that uh, as time permits. But the other thing you mustn't forget is circumstances. What previously happened, in many instances, the shape of a particular administration will be a reaction to what went before that. We can certainly see that with Major, the way in which Major was essentially forced to adopt a more collegiate position, having just taken over from a quasi-dictatorial Thatcher. And indeed, to a certain extent, Brown was in the same position. Brown was uh, following Blair, Blair ran an even more centralized administration than Thatcher. And so what previously happened is very much going to determine, uh, or to a certain extent, going to determine the shape of the, the next administration. What is actually happening now is also very important. If you're in a time of crisis, um, then there's always going to be a certain inclination to try to govern from the center. Um, and when things calm down a bit, perhaps it's fair to delegate. And perhaps in times of uh, financial crisis as we are now, uh, there's a significant role for the Chancellor of the Exchequer. You can't necessarily be driving things ideologically, although that seems to be what's happening. Uh, but again, we can talk about that uh, in a little more detail in class. But do try to think about it beforehand and think about who these big players are in Cabinet and what exactly their roles are. In terms of responsibility, all decisions of government are binding on all government members. This is the notion of collective responsibility. And that means that government has collective authority from parliament. So the government has a collective responsibility to parliament. If you're not happy with that, then you have to leave parliament. So all decisions of government, uh, you have to leave government, sorry. So all decisions of government are perceived to be unanimous. Uh, that means we've got free discussion. Uh, but that all happens behind closed doors. Uh, and once those decisions are made, you can't go around moaning about it afterwards. Uh, and of course, unity is strength. The more divided, the more openly divided a government is, the weaker it's going to be and the more, um, the more prone to attack. And we can certainly see that with the current shadow cabinet who doesn't know whether they're coming or going. And uh, as a result of which, it's fair game. Certainly when Blair's, when the Blair administration started to weaken, uh, and the dictatorial ties that were holding it together started to dissolve. It was much easier for the Conservatives to uh, prize open the gaps. In terms of individual responsibility, the buck very much stops with the minister for what that department has been doing. Ministers are accountable for the decisions of their department. They're de accountable for the way in which those decisions are implemented. And of course, they are responsible for their own personal conduct. So you'll notice here that we've got three of these. We've got uh, three points because this ties in very nicely with the B question and the C question. I am very much aware that I haven't put any evidence on these. So this is where you need to have a look at it yourself. And of course, we can discuss the bits that follow uh, in class. Now, we're going to look at different styles of government. That's going to come up in the next presentation, but I think that's going to help tremendously if you've done a little bit of prep on that, if you've had a chance to think about these various things. And I look forward to discussing all of that uh, when the chance comes. Great, look at this. This is awesome. Look, uh, da, 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 that's, uh, I don't want to, no, spoilers alert. Here we go. Oh, come on, come on, come on now. Go, go, go. Make it go now. Here, look at this. This is so cool. Da, 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 da. Ah, uh, yeah, this took me ages. Uh, anyway, I look forward to discussing that with you when the time comes. Um, and uh, that's going to be fun. Speak to you then.